publishing director at Sage. And I'd like Paulie to welcome you to what I hope will be an invigorating, stimulating, um, debate-driven day. Also a particularly timely day, I think, a, a day to, um, to catch our breath and take stock after a rather frenzied period of change. From, it feels like a long time since that print report first came out and what we've seen since. Many points and counterpoints have been made along the way. Um, but I think it's a great chance for us as a, as a humanities and social sciences community to engage with and debate the open access changes that are upon us. Quite often those debates have happened um, but haven't necessarily always had the right people in the room to really engage with it from this point of view. It's also a chance for us to hear from a diverse range of voices within that community, whether it's from the early career scholar through to the senior professor, or whether it's from um, the, the strong advocates of the changes of afoot through to people who are more cautious in their approach. Um, we also have a chance to hear from a diverse range of stakeholders, ranging from the library point of view to the funder point of view, publishers obviously, but the university managers and so on. Which of course is a reminder of just what a complex network in which these debates, both around the means through which we achieve a good school education system um, and the ends we're trying to serve as well. It's quite easy, I think, for those ends to be lost from view when we focus on those means. And I think it's worth us just having in mind throughout the day um, what are the things we can all agree are needed from an effective scholarly communication system. A system that enables sustainable creation of knowledge claims which reach their relevant audiences. That humanities and social science young scholars are able to find a way to develop their authoritative voices and for their claims to have the impact it needs to have in society at large and in our understanding of ourselves. And while it's been much debated about whether there are particular characteristics which are distinctive of the humanities and social sciences, I think there are some aspects of that which will come out today which are absolutely undeniable. And the first and most obvious of those issues is the question of, of funding. The funding in the system for HSS is radically different from the funding in the system in, in uh, STM. And that bears on this question of sustainable mechanisms that allow um, new sort of mechanisms to emerge. Um, I think that uh, we are also aware that that funding, such as it is, is, in, is under attack across different parts of the globe. In the US, um, as I'm sure most of you know, the Coburn Amendment went through. Um, Tom Coburn's long held, held wish to circumscribe the amount of funding that goes to um, humanities and social science research actually passed a voice vote, severely restricting the amount of um, research funding that can, that can support political science research in particular. And that's not a one off. We know that's being picked up by um, Eric Cantor, the House of Majority Leader, and who's looking to widen that kind of restriction to um, social science more generally. And that bears on this question because the piece of funding that COBA was trying to restrict is about $11 million out of the budget of over $7 billion in the National Science Foundation. So it's very important, I think, we have that um, in, 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 in our minds. I'm glad to say that we're all part of a coalition to um, engage in, in reversing that restriction at the moment. Um, but that's not the only issue that's distinctive about humanities and social sciences. It's also um, clear that there are aspects of the nature of intellectual property and, and the nature of knowledge claims that are made um, that have that have a bearing on, on whether we want openness to, to imply automatic reuse. And I think that debate has, has started to really hear more about it today. There's also the question of just what are the mechanisms through which um, sort of credibility maintaining mechanisms that are available to young scholars and the role of learned societies, all of which I think have their particular flavour and shape when we look at the humanities and social sciences um, context. So I'm hoping we'll be hearing a lot of those. Obviously we're not going to be able to cover all the issues today. Our, our hope is not necessarily to come up with um, once and for all solutions um, today, but actually to at least uh, shed light on some of these um, issues and to maybe identify some paths forward and to have a properly engaged conversation between those who are actually um, well placed to do it with great knowledge. So I'm looking forward to it very much. Um, it um, remains for me actually to thank uh, the British Academy, the Academy of Social Sciences and the LSC for the part they've had to play in, um, in today's events. But I think a special thanks are needed uh, for David Mannering, who's a colleague of ours at SAGE, who many of you will know as an incisive 
an astute commentator on matters of a, and a, and a very active tweeter. Um, and today was his brainchild. It was his particular conception, I think, that's been turned into reality today. So um, I, I'd like to just acknowledge that. So with that, I think it's for me now to invite up uh, Nigel Vincent from the British Academy, who will be making some opening remarks. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure uh, and honor to be here. I think people will know that uh, the British Academy is, uh, has been involved in, this, in issues about open access for um, a good while now. I called the talk the problem space because what I want to try and do is not so much pose answers or put forward answers as try and define the space and some of the issues, but in a way that addresses the fact that when open access is uh, often advocated, as it is, it's advocated in kind of moral terms. It's a good thing. It's a public good that we should be able to have free access to the output of uh, scholarly research. And I don't personally disagree with that. Uh, but that means we should try and think about the issues not in terms of the practicalities of whether it will make us good for REF in 2020 or, um, as it were, parochial policies about what RCUK does in, 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 in this country. But what, what are the general issues and reasons, um, and how do they affect the set of disciplines that, that are our concern here today? There is, uh, down on the table, some copies of, of a collection of essays that, that we, we published, um, edited by myself and, and, and my colleague Chris Wickham. The British Academy, for those people who aren't familiar with it, is uh, the National Academy for Humanities and Social Sciences, so this is kind of our, our natural home ground. Um, our fellows are elected on the basis of distinguished published work, so um, we care about how things get into uh, print. We fund postdocs uh, and small grants, so we fund people um, particularly at the early end of, of, of their careers, so those points that Zia just mentioned about um, younger researchers are important to us. Um, and we also publish as we have monograph series that come out by an agreement with the Clarendon Press, and we have a, a, an open access APC free journal, the Journal of the British Academy. Start with some facts that are derived from uh, a little sort of informal survey of outputs in uh, RA 2008. Uh, here are the publishing profiles of a bunch of dis humanities disciplines um, according to whether what was submitted by institutions that were judged by the peer review panels to be the best in their field. Um, uh, according to whether they, what they submitted were books, chapters, or journal articles. Um, it isn't that I think chemistry is a humanities discipline, but I just wanted you to see what the comparison is. If you look at a classic, central, um, natural science discipline like chemistry, there is nothing but journal articles. If you look at English, 40% of what was submitted uh, in, the, in the last RA was in the form of, of books. Social sciences, Slightly different kind of profile, fewer books, uh, fewer book chapters, more journal articles, but in the general class of, of social sciences, uh, sociology, law, politics, still nothing like the complete predominance of articles that you would find in, um, in, in, in a natural science. Interestingly then, economics is the one, quote, social science that uh, configures itself in publication terms uh, pretty well like a natural science. Nice kind of minimal contrast, there's one institution in the country that made two submissions to the anthropology panel. The biological anthropologists published exactly like biologists, the social anthropologists public, published exactly like sociologists. So what that suggests is that we've actually got three broad classes of disciplines. Those that publish three-thirds all of their work in journals, those that publish about two-thirds of their work in journals, and those that publish one-third or sometimes even less in journals. And the point about these, field, these, these patterns is that they're not exceptional. Sometimes the conversation goes, ah, oh, well, HSS is exceptional with respect to publication. It's not exceptional. It fits into a multi-dimensional space. Different disciplines work in different ways. Mathematicians, for example, often turn out, in, in recent, a, while, a while back in Manchester there was a uh, a debate in Senate about length of journals submission uh, to be retained on open access library shelves and the mathematicians were together with the humanities in wanting to be able to read the 19th century journals 
because that's where the result was first proved. So there are lots of different dimensions for different disciplines, and we should just try and understand the nature of that disciplinary space rather than prioritize the needs of one uh, subset. Different disciplines have different publication <coughs> profiles. Importantly, as far as I can see, these profiles are relatively constant over time and institution, and that's because they hold not just in this country but in other countries, and they define the benchmark of the way those disciplines work, and that's important for establishing and maintaining our international reputation. When we look at the international context, then the dominant trend seems to be towards green OA, so already in the international context uh, we, we look different. What they don't have in many countries is research exercises like RAE and REF, which are able to force compliance with certain modes of publication. So a big driver that exists in this country, and has existed for a long time, uh, either doesn't exist, as for example, um, countries like the Netherlands don't work their research evaluation in the same kind of way, or they exist, like in Italy recently, the ANVOR in Italy, uh, but it's not directly linked to funding in the same way. And what we find with the international journals, and that's something that, that uh, matters, and I'll talk a little bit about that again in, in a minute, is that many of those journals will remain non-compliant. I'm, I'm an Italianist, and most of the journals that I read that are in Italian are not remotely open access, and the debate hasn't even begun there. And they're also not CCBY, and I'll come back to that. So what does this mean for people who publish in international journals? Whether And there are two subdomains here. There are the international journals that are um, the big leading players in the disciplines, often um, in social sciences, American journals, or for those of us who work in uh, different regions and areas, and sometimes maybe even often publish in languages other than English, what about the languages of, of those journals? So what I want to do is to try and say briefly something about how open access applies to the three types of publication that were in the uh, tables derived from the RA. So the journal article issue, the monograph, or what in the recent document Hefke has started to call the long form of publication, uh, and, and book chapters. And in relation to journal articles, I can tell you that there is an ongoing project that has been funded by Hefke in collaboration with the British Academy, for which um, Chris Wigan is the PI, uh, which is trying to investigate discipline by discipline the uh, set of questions that I've just outlined. So what, in particular, are the half-lives of journal articles? How, how quickly does a journal get, uh, does an article get out of, out of use and out of citation? I, mean, I wrote something not so long ago uh, and I cited an article from 1894, and the copy editor turned it into 1994, and I had to turn it back and say, no, it was 1894. Um, whereas I think to a biologist, 1994 is already a pr pretty long time ago, and 2004 is dangerously old. Um, so it varies very much from journal and discipline to discipline, and, and, and Chris's project is investigating that. He's also investigating then the effect of embargo periods because those are related to um, the, the need to be able to access journals um, speedily. And the involvement of non-UK journal publishing, the, the, the issue I was talking about before, about journals that are published uh, particularly in, in, in European languages, but increasingly in East Asian and Asian languages. Uh, and the project will look in more detail at uh, a commitment to um, open access uh, overseas. Chris will be speaking. He's speaking briefly on a on a on a little um, video link that you can see on the academy's website. And tomorrow uh, there is a, uh, a question and answer session on the Guardian website from 12 to 2, I think, uh, at which Chris uh, is is participating in and will be responding to some of the questions that have arisen in relation to his project. OK, so a few words about monographs. They tend to be single authors, not necessarily, but they, they usually are. They're not captured by the usual bibliometric methods. They are the inter I wrote this slide, and then I realized it's a horrible ambiguity. I don't mean gold in the other sense of gold. They are the standard point of reference for some uh, disciplines. Uh, 
and something I'll come back to in relation to the recent welcome policy on, on, on uh, access for open access for, for, for articles for books is there's a difficult boundary here between academic and trade lists. So it raises the question of the way in which the writing is done and the public that it's aimed at. Some people say that monographs are the kind of thing um, that uh, used to be done by older scholars uh, and aren't sustainable in the modern world. So it's interesting that when we did a poll of our uh, postdoctoral fellows who are by definition, the, the sort of the beginning of the next generation of, of scholars, uh, the general reaction was positive, and people wanted to be able to produce a monograph at the end of their project. And this is just a, a quotation from 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 one of those. When we look at monographs, there are various options around. There is gold with an APC. That is to say, you could have a, a direct funding that Austrian Austrian Research Council pays fourteen thousand euro. Um, as part of any project in order to ensure that a monograph at the end um, can be published. And that's this very similar to the policy that Wellcome announced uh, earlier this, this year. You can have something like green, but with an embargo period, and then the issue would be how long, because by definition you would expect that the half-life of a monograph was much longer than the half-life of a journal article. And then you've got various kinds of mixed models I won't go into. Um, the details here, um, but there are plenty of, of public discussions about those. Um, there's a new hefty group on monographs that's to be chaired by Jeff Krosick, and that aims to explore and understand the scale and nature of problems for monographs and the place and purposes of monograph in, in the academic context. Uh, and the emerging models that accommodate open access. So uh, I don't know whether David Sweeney, when he talks this afternoon, might say something more about that initiative. And there are people here. I, I see Peter Mandler over there is, uh, is, is, is part of the expert reference group for that. And there may be others. I mentioned earlier on the, the welcome policy. This is the quotation from their announcement in May this year that Wellcome Trust announces that it is to extend its open access policy to include all scholarly monographs and book chapters. Um, we'll make funds available for the payment of open access publishing charges. In other words, the gold kind of model extrapolated to, to books. But they then have to add this rider. The new policy does not apply to textbooks, trade books, general reference works, or works of fiction. And part of the issue um, we leave out the work sufficient, but part of the issue for humanities and social sciences is it's much, much more difficult to draw those boundaries when you come to very successful types of uh, publication, I, things that I can think of. Uh, one that I, I read recently was Mary Beard's book on Pompeii, I think of David Abulafia's book, The Great Sea. Those are eminently scholarly, important contributions. They're also extremely readable, and you can get them on three for two in Waterston. Um, so there isn't a clear boundary there, and that's something of a problem. Say something about book chapters. Here's a, a rather cynical quotation about book chapters from um, Dorothy Bishop, who's a, a developmental psychologist. And on her blog, she says, if you write a chapter for an edited book, you might as well write the paper and then bury it in a hole in the ground. Which is kind of worrying if a third of your academic output is book chapters, as we saw in the earlier tables. It was for some disciplines. On the other hand, there's Peter Webster, a historian at the British Library, has written about the reasons why it might be good to have book chapters. If you put a collection of essays together, you get a range of different views on a topic in one volume. You get mutual peer review by the authors, which is often better than the kind of anonymous peer review in the sense it goes into it in, in more detail and there are more opinions expressed about your chapter before it emerges. Um, and that the whole is therefore greater than the sum of the parts. And when you think about that, book chapters and online publishing, book chapters could really be rescued if it really if Doris is really right that books uh, risk falling into, or book chapters risk falling into a hole in the ground, then open access and electronic publishing is a way of rescuing them from that kind of invisibility. 
and you could have exactly as in fact you have with the um, open access collection that we edited that I had on the screen earlier on, you can either access the whole thing or you can print out um, just one individual chapter that, that is of interest to you. But there are the same issues about um, uh, access and sustainability as there are for books. So book chapters are an interesting, I think, underrated form of publication uh, that could actually benefit in, in this context. And they have properties of books and properties of articles. Um, just then want to say something about license type and, and text mining. Because part of the science-driven, Finch-driven um, gold open access issue is that there should not only be gold APCs or um, APC free, but immediately available, whatever um, version of gold you have, but they should also have a CCBY uh, license on them. And what that means is you can then freely reuse the material in the publication for other purposes. And of course, what they have in mind is the fact that large numbers of, of, of scientific papers contain very important data sets and it's reusing and reanalyzing re the data set and being able to extract the figures and reuse them, which is important to them. And I understand that, and particularly in the context of uh, bioscience, biomedical publication, where the rate of publication is, is terrifyingly large. The notion that an individual researcher could get his or her head around the, the literature is, is, is long gone, and you need then computational techniques to simply sort the material that's out there. And of course, CCBY does allow you unlimited text and data mining, but for disciplines where what matters is the prose formulation of the argument rather than the data set as such, then text mining is much more problematic. Text mining uh, is a technique that depends on a lot of pre-structure in the text. Uh, and that's precisely what you don't have in um, articles that are written by uh, historians, literary critics, uh, philosophers, social commentators, and so on. And they're also problematic using those techniques because they find it hard to distinguish between quotation, if you search for keywords, whether the keyword is in your writing or in the writing of somebody else that has been quoted, um, and what if actually the key word isn't apparently there because it was in German and the text you quoted was in German. So there are a lot of problems with um, free allowed use of text mining. There is also the issue of plagiarism. And personally, I think that's, that's rather less important than these kind of the danger of misrepresentation, misquotation, misattribution. Uh, and I was interested to see, because I started to read a little bit of the text mining literature, because a, a lot of the text mining literature is, um, is, is, is well, a lot of the text miners have backgrounds in, in, in linguistic analysis. And uh, there's a journal that publishes a lot of this stuff. It's called Bioinformatics. Interestingly, it doesn't have a CCBY license. It publishes under BYNC. So that, I find that slightly odd. Um, <laughs> Just a, a final point about OAM peer review, just to raise it. I'm not going to say anything uh, in detail about it, but I'm sure it'll come up later in the day. It is, as everybody knows, traditional journal and book publishing is built on PR. And personally, as somebody who spent a lot of his life involved in, in RAE, um, I think one of the great benefits of the RAE system is the where it works off peer review. What's the quality of what's submitted, not where did it appear? Um, and that's the guarantee of quality and reputation. It's then, as I say, the foundation of RAE and REF. It isn't the case that OA necessarily undermines PR, um, but some of the open access ventures uh, question the value of PR. So the very interesting essay in the, in the Academy collection by Martin Eve, looking at the whole issue of peer review and whether um, that is uh, that successful non-peer review type policy that is familiar from um, the Public Library of Science will extrapolate when you move to um, ventures like, like his, uh, where what you're publishing is um, work from the humanities and social sciences, particularly in his case, the, the humanities. So that's my general attempt to introduce the day and give you some set of, of issues, raise some questions, and um, then I'll lead into the, uh, the, the, the next panel. So. so if I could
could ask the panellists for our first session to come and uh, join me on the stage. Uh, so our first panel is Why OA? Which OA? And I'm going to hand straight over to Professor Adam Tickell from the University of Birmingham, who's going to chair this session. Um, thanks, uh, thanks very much, and um, I just want to say a few preliminary remarks, although I'm chair, I'm going to, with the permission, I'm going to review my, my position here just to say uh, what my own take is, and then I'm going to introduce the speakers and then uh, And I think, I, I think it's important to be up front, because as we all have seen, I was, like um, a couple of other people in the room, I was a member of the, uh, the Finch group, and I think there are quite a few bits that have come out um, around that, and I think there are quite a few bits uh, that, that we tell ourselves as social scientists, um, and people in humanities, I'm a social scientist myself, um, around what open access and the open access environment uh, looks like. And I think we need to understand the politics. And I think, for me, the metapolitics is not this creation myth that we, uh, that we sometimes hear, in fact, I was discussing with somebody over coffee before we started, um, about when David Willits was writing his book and that he couldn't get access to publications. Um, but the bigger story is around the politics around transparency. Um, transparency is one of the things that all political parties agree on. Um, it's one of the things that the coalition parties agree on. And the way transparency impacts on universities is, I think, in three ways. Um, the first of them is around um, the fact that we're subject to freedom of, freedom of information. Uh, legislation. Um, the second is around um, the, the growing moves towards open data, um, and you'll notice, you'll know, I'm sure, the research councils have policies on open data, uh, which will be pretty hard to, for us to comply with, I think. Um, and the third around the third way that transparency hits us in the university sector is around open access to research that's funded by from public sources. Um, and to make it clear, I see no principal reason um, why that's a bad thing. Um, I see lots of practical reasons, reasons why it might be a bad thing. And the truth is, is that much research, <coughs> anybody who reads it from, from a lay audience might find it impenetrable. Um, and that's as true for, for philosophy and some areas of all the humanities and social sciences as it is for, um, for nuclear physics or whatever it might be. But I, Personally, I don't see that as a reason not to let people have a look. Um, but there has been more pushback in the humanities and social sciences than there has been in other, any other area of science. Um, uh, I find that surprising when I think there is a real public hunger for the research that we do. Um, and I think we can evidence that through, um, through the readership of a, of a journal like the London Review of Books, which isn't just academics, although it feels often that, uh, that it is. Um, I think the, um, the listenership for In Our Time is not just an academic audience, and I think the listenership for, for Thinking Loud is also not just an academic audience. And often what they're doing on that program is they're talking about papers which the audience can't go and access. And I think that's kind of, uh, that's a very perverse thing when we ought to be celebrating um, the interest in the work that we do. Um, so in fact, if, if you like, I don't think the barbarians are at the gate, I think the barbarians are actually wanting to read what we're trying to, uh, to tell them. Um, I think there are a couple of other, other things I just really wanted to say. Um, the first of them, uh, and David Sweeney will talk about this I'm sure later, is that the, um, the implications for the REF in, in 2020 are not as scary as they might seem at the outset. Um, so we've done an analysis at the University of Birmingham of how compliant we would be if that policy had, had been in place. Um, and that we had been complying with it, if you like, if you like. So the percentage of our submission to REF that's going to go in next month that, had, that was eligible for an open access submission under the green embargo or the gold pay for system. And we're nearly compliant already. Um, that's not to say that we have some, our papers are in the repository or we pay for them, but had we been compliant, then we're nearly there already. Because the threshold, is, I'm hoping, will be quite low. 
Um, and all the books and chapters and, um, and non-compliant journals will actually be in the exceptional uh, percentage. Um, the second is that although um, there's a policy preference towards gold, the real outcome and the, the, the political outcome is there is no preference at all in the practical sense for either research councils or for the funding council between gold or green. Um, which means that if we, take, if we put our papers into a repository two years after they're published, we will be compliant with the research council policy. Um, and the third, I think, is really important thing to say is that I know of no university which um, would seek to constrain where anybody publishes. Um, and if there is any university which is seeking to constrain where anybody publishes, um, we need to know about that because um, that's certainly the very, very strong view of the, uh, of the Russell Group. I know that the 1994 group takes a similar position. So um, I think we need to take the heat out of it and make sure that our staff don't feel we're trying to constrain them when I, I don't believe there is any such intent. So that's, uh, that's my take. And now I'm going to turn from um, advocate to, um, to neutrality. Um, and I'm going to introduce this morning's speakers. Um, uh, um, first of all, uh, we have Jonathan Gray. Um, Jonathan works at the Open Knowledge Foundation. Um, the Open Knowledge Foundation is dedicated to opening up data to the widest possible number of people. Um, and the aim is to use data more effectively. Um, and Jonathan's led on a number of really important initiatives, such as the Data Journalism Handbook, um, Open Spending, and the Public Domain Review. Um, and in his spare time, he manages to be a PhD student in philosophy uh, at Royal Holloway uh, University of London. Um, second up will be Peter Mandler. Um, Peter is a uh, professor of modern cultural history at uh, Cambridge. Um, and I'm sure many of you know that his research explores the political, cultural, social, and intellectual hi uh, history of modern Britain. Um, and also, he's a historian of the social sciences. Um, most pertinently, though, Peter is president of the Royal Historical Society, um, and the RHS has been amongst the most um, vocal and, I'd say, effective um, opponents of a particular approach to open access in, um, in the United Kingdom. Um, Charlotte Velda um, is professor of intellectual property law at the University of Exeter, um, and her research focuses on intellectual property and internet law. And in this capacity, she's advised a formidable group of national and international bodies. Um, her expertise means that she's well placed to move beyond the rhetorical um, and can comment on not only aspirations around open access, but some of the possibilities and the legal pitfalls around that the changes could bring. Um, and finally, um, Brian Hole is the founder of Ubiquity Press at uh, UCL. Um, Ubiquity Press is an open access only publisher um, that's spun out of UCL um, and it has a great portfolio of journals and e-books. Um, and the press has worked with UCL uh, and is exploring relationships with other universities. Um, Brian is also studying a PhD um, in archaeology. So the plan for the day, uh, for the morning, is that our speakers will speak for 10 minutes or so, and um, the or so is about a second either way. Um, and then we'll open up to questions and comments from the floor rather than just, just being in discussion about uh, four or five people at the time. Um, so um, first over to John. I will do this. Uh, hello. Um, so first of all, I'd like to start off by raising the question, um, what is research? I'm stepping back a little bit. I know this is not a deep debate, so I've detailed this question. Let start off with um, Perhaps you might be tempted to talk about um, increasing the stock of human knowledge <coughs> and influential OECD management research statistics. Person. Uh, or perhaps we might turn back to the etymology of the words, um, the 16th century French research game, or to search, uh, to search for truth, to search for better ways to understand the world around us. Um, or perhaps we might invoke the, uh, the metaphor of the Republic of Letters, uh, research, research is a kind of global conversation whereby scholars from around the world build on and respond to a shared body of arguments and evidence about different matters of concern. Um, but perhaps all of these metaphors of quests for knowledge and scholarly republic sound a bit too grand when it comes to characterising what scholars actually do um, and what we're engaged in um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, if someone just asks us at the end of the day how our contribution to this, the sum of human knowledge is going, 
probably the same that they keep showing. Yeah, the data that we have in research is often much messier, more complex, and more mundane, as I'm sure you're well aware. If we're really pushed by what we actually do as scholars, we have to get into the bits of describing an unwieldy constellation of different people, objects, and practices, and from editorial reports to email threads, style guidelines, and spelling conventions, indexes and search engines, bookmarks and bibliographies, legal agreements, literature reviews, conference dinners, course proposals, <coughs> seminars, scholarly societies, and so on. This sprawling edifice of interactions and exchanges is what scholarship is made of. And today I'd like to invite you to reflect on whether you believe that this contingent bricolage of arrangements is adequate for the task that we'd like to give to us, in particular to succeed in supporting the kind of scholarly exchange that we'd like to have in the 21st century. If sheer quantity is a measure of success, then things aren't going too bad. The amount of research being published is growing at an astonishing rate. Recent studies estimate that around 50 million journal articles have been published since their first appearance in the mid 17th century. And this colossus is estimated to be expanding at an estimate that rough um, 1.5 to 2 million articles per year, which is about 34%. Um, but of course, more people publishing more words does not necessarily mean that our system of scholarly communication is serving us well. Scholarship is not just about publication, but about interaction, interpretation, exchange, deliberation, discourse, debate, and controversy. Um, so the philosopher of Plato writes to understand the kind of uh, this is kind of cheap mark, there's a kind of clash that occurs between two people trying to come to terms with something with different viewpoints, a flash that arises from the friction discussion and momentarily floods everything with light. Um, scholarship is of course not just about the production of text, text which has been processed, reviewed, and packaged up in the right way, in accordance with the dictates of style manners and keeping theoretical or methodological genre. Scholarship is about the way in which constellations of people and objects produce meaning, understanding, and insight through interaction and acts of interpretation. The value of a journal article is not the stated impact factor of the journal, any more than the value of the scholar is the aggregate of his or her publishing record. The value of a piece of scholarly text is the interaction it has with its readers, and the sparks it generates, the friction and light that it produces, whether tomorrow or in a hundred years' time. Uh, I'd like to say that, unfortunately, our current system of scholarly communication is often developed with other priorities in mind. Um, for a start, it echoes our broader cultural and social attitudes towards sharing the fruits of our collective um, creative and intellectual labour more generally. Um, and it has a disproportionate focus on protection and compensation, on complication and control of our society. The default is still that our creations cannot be shared without payment or explicit permission. And even though they are unlikely to receive a penny for it, scholars are often inclined to be more guarded than generous about sharing their published work. This is in, in sort of my experience. This social and cultural hostility to sharing in turn reflects the state of the law, which is profoundly imbalanced towards protecting and rewarding rights holders rather than recognising that copyright is an instrument which is supposed to serve society and, and to strike a balance between protecting the private interests and providing the public with access to the fruits of collective intellectual labour. Furthermore, the academic career structures in many disciplines are heavily focused around and driven by publication. I'm sure you're all aware. Um, not even on scholarly output per se, but on the very specific forms and genres of publication, um, with strong focus on certain journals and publishers. Um, articles and monographs have become the de facto currency of scholarship in certain venues that work more than others. Um, other forms of engagement from collaborative projects to conferences are often not recognised or only recognised insofar as they result in publication. In publishing operations such as journal titles and monograph series are the stars which structure the orbits of scholarly communication, then we may forget that what gives them their gravitational force is ultimately the scholars and scholarly, com scholarly communities associated with them. Hence, we may conflate the trust, reputation, and authority that derives from the scrutiny, energy, and attention of a particular group of people, particularly the scholars, with the avenue through which this is manifested, then the publication, uh, the title of particular publication series. So entangled are the reputations of scholars and publishing operations that sometimes you might find it difficult to wrench them apart and to recall that ultimately it is publications which are dependent on scholars and not the other around. The result of all these things is the lamentable situation in which we find ourselves in today, 
whereby a huge amount of insect energy and attention of researchers is followed in the creation of products for the publishing industry, which are then locked up and sold back to them, uh, sold back to the institutions which employ them, the very same institutions which effectively subsidise the creation, editorial, and peer review of said products. In 1999, a scholar of the library wrote a report unpacking the implications of the situation, which they described as the uh, a crisis in scholarly publishing. Um, which they said was a vicious cycle of increasing prices and increasing distribution, straining or breaking library budgets and leading to cancellations of journals and cuts other acquisitions, as well as a dangerous erosion in confidence in the integrity of theory. Ultimately, they concluded that the flow of scholarly communication is at stake, eroding the academic mission. The system of scholarship that we currently have is exclusive, protected, and restrictive on the whole. The light, insight, and scholarly interaction catalyzed by these documents in which we so heavily invest is obscured to all but to those who can afford to pay, those who are part of the institution which can afford to pay, or those who are willing to break the law to take what they need. I think it's worth explicitly highlighting um, <laughs> that the current academic climate, not just in the UK but in many countries around the world, means that a great many institutions are increasingly hard pressed for cash, but a great many aspiring researchers are or will be operating without institutions. Hence, unless there is a significant change, it looks like more and more research should be locked out, excluded, or forced to spend significant sums in order to keep the rest of the development in the field. Unfortunately, the social, cultural, and institutional conditions we looked at above conspire to create environment in humanities and social sciences, which is generally unfavorable to the idea of open access, which at first sight might look to be an affront to authorial strength and integrity, an impediment to career progress, and at best, an ignorant, at worst, brutally indifferent to how scholarship and scholarly communities actually function. I would like to claim that. In many ways, these things are means. Open access to research is not only commensurate with the of integrity, career progress, and flourishing of free and independent scholarly communities, perhaps even more conducive to the realization of each of these things than subscription based access. Open access enables researchers to present the record of the views more fully and more accurately. So, for example, it's harder to overlook arguments, claims, or qualifications, and make publications which are less accessible. It gives their work greater exposure and increases the probability that publications will lead to meaningful interaction. And it affords richer, more sustained, more comprehensive, and more inclusive engagement with what, um, again, my philosopher um, Hans Georg Gallman calls the conversation that we are. What must happen if we're to make this conversation of people, things, and practices more open? If we want to make our scholarly system less exclusively focused on protection, monetization, and control, and more fair, more inclusive, and more collaborative? What must happen for it to become more centered on the production of meaningful interaction? than on the um, production of saleable commodities for the publishing industry. Two critical ingredients are public interest policy making, which is sensitive to the dynamics of scholarship, which is a very important point, and proactive support for researchers to champion new initiatives and arrangements, discipline by discipline, institution by institution, country by country. In the UK, open access policy is outpacing researchers supposed to benefit from it and risks forcing scholars away from familiar operations and arrangements before they have had time to create, plan, or even imagine new co ones to start using. Hence, and in conclusion, um, I think it's imperative that researchers, including those who are here today um, involved in research and mathematics and social sciences, become actively involved in critically reflecting on, reimagining, and recomposing scholarly communication so that we have a system which is fairer, more inclusive, and more sensitive around interaction and conversation than around subscription based products and products. Great, thank you very much. I suggest that you move uh, straight to the feed. Right, well, I'm, I'm very glad that um, Adam introduced me um, as someone who um, has been arguing against particular forms of open access, but I would have preferred to even more to have been introduced to someone who advocates all forms of open access which um, support and sustain academic freedom and quality. Um, what, uh, what started a lot of us in the humanities learning societies on this journey um, was, um, in my case, a, a, a delegation that I joined of historians to the business department after publication of the Fitch Report. Uh, where we went to argue for forms of open access which we thought would, were suitable to the advantage of social sciences, and we were told by um, the historian of the business department that, um, that we were on a transition to goals and uh, we, they couldn't possibly differentiate between um, disciplines 
uh, and that was that. And it was, it was the alarm raised by uh, that position that um, caused us a lot of us to take up these issues. I think because we've been jumping up and down ever since, um, we the, the, we've managed to deflect that um, course. And I, I entirely agree with what Adam said that uh, in fact green is going to be the predominant form of open access, especially for HSS. And um, we're moving towards a policy. I'm glad to say where different forms of open access are uh, devised for different disciplines. But that would only have happened. That only has happened because of people in the medicine, social sciences, and speaking up vigorously. Uh, and when they do so, they should not be um, accused of betraying some pure principles of open access, what we're seeking, or models of open access that work for us. That's what I want to focus on. I want to start um, with a, a little story. About 15 years ago, my learning society, the Royal Historical Society, um, committed its um, major publishing operation, the, its, its bibliography of British history, to uh, an open access course with a grant from the HRC. We put this enormous bibliography that we've been working on for almost 100 years. Um, on open access, um, with 500,000 records, as it now is um, giving um, a, a complete account of everything that had ever been written about British history. Not access to the full text, although we're working on that because most of that's not open access, but at least the bibliographical records. And a searchable, in a searchable form, which allows you to, to develop highly tailored bibliographies on any subject under the sun. Um, that was funded by the HRC for five years, and they renewed it. And then after their second, the first renewal, they said that they, that they, they could continue funding it. Um, and their evaluator of that grant said, um, sadly, at the end of the, of the grant period, um, he regretted very much that the HRC was defunding this project. And it, it, it was essential now that the commercial partner um, to allow this 100-year-old um, asset to, to live on in the future. And we very reluctantly turned um, to that um, uh, recourse, and we have a, a successful um, partnership with a commercial publisher where we're charging, we think, a, a moderate fee, but we would very much uh, rather have this uh, resource still in open access. And from that um, lesson, as well as, of course, much other consideration of this question, we've drawn three conclusions which I want to um, sort of offer up as starting points for thinking about open access for HSS subjects. First of all, um, editorial work in humanities and social sciences isn't free. The work on the bibliography, uh, now called Bibliography of British and Irish History, um, had involved a full-time editor, many, many hours of gratis labor from academics, sometimes stimulated with small honorary, um, and considerable IT input laterally, which uh, was, was not at all uh, free, but even very cheap. Especially for the enhancements the AHRC required us to add as a result of moving to an open access electronic but even an HSS journal requires more than a STEM journal, a long peer review um, with a much higher rejection rate. Um, one of the um, underappreciated aspects of humanities journals in particular is the service they offer to young scholars in um, giving them uh, you know, reasonable objective peer review of their work for free uh, with a very, uh, with relatively low rates of success. I think the 2009 Mellon study found that uh, humanities journals had about an 11% acceptance rate, whereas most STEM journals had uh, over 40% acceptance rate. So you do a lot of peer review, you have to um, handle a lot of manuscripts that, that does involve clerical work, even if you're doing it online. It, it involves a lot of editorial work. Um, the, uh, when I was editor of a journal, um, I read um, and commented editorially on all of the um, articles we were going to accept. Um, then there's line editing, copy editing, proofreading. It's a literary product, it requires a lot of processing, and because we are open to, to all comers, we, uh, and, and we get a lot of applications, uh, submissions from people relatively early in their career, it involves more work still. And for most journals, there's also a very um, onerous and, and um, time-consuming business of, of uh, commissioning um, uh, book reviews, and therefore handling a lot of books. And again, even if this was all online, it wouldn't come free. Um, now, all of this reflects the fact that HSS journals are literary products and not just reports of data. And some people don't like that. They don't like peer review. They don't like editorial work. They don't like um, the, the, the kind of um, credentializing and processing that goes on in journals. And they would like to um, multiply versions um, of, of uh, works on, on the net, um, uh, do peer review after the fact, or maybe not at all, and in general speed up the process of writing. And I can see that there are arguments in favor of that, but they, they're not arguments for open access. Say there are things for something else, on a different attitude to the research process, and I think we need to separate those two. Um, in any case, I want to stand up for the kind of work that HSS journals do. 
And I want to stand up for the carefully written, well edited, thoroughly peer reviewed, slow burning, um, slowly but surely um, article, which doesn't have to be available in multiple versions, which the author has already rejected and actually may be embarrassed by. It doesn't have to be read within weeks or months um, of its completion. Most journals do these things, um, and I think they do them well, and when they don't, the readers and their editors um, should complain. The one journal that I know, uh, which didn't sign up to a statement that 30 history journals made um, asking for longer embargo periods to protect their moderate incomes, the one journal I know that didn't want to do that said to me they didn't want to do it because they didn't think that their publisher provided any services that were worth paying for and just worth protecting. Um, and therefore, the, the, you know, they, they didn't want to participate in, a, in, a, in, a, in an enterprise which um, protected publishers. And so, my, my answer to that was: well, Does that mean the rest of us, who, who are happy with our publishers, or at least you know are engaged in, in struggle with our publishers to get a good product out of them, that we should just give up the ghost? Should we all um, race to the bottom and accept this uh, lowest common denominator? I, I thought not. I thought that was throwing the baby out of the bathwater. Okay, that's the first principle. It's not. Free, if not even really cheap, um, to, to produce and to disseminate humanities research. And the second principle is given that it's not cheap, um, we, uh, we, and we have to find the money somewhere, we cannot rely on government funding directly to sustain it. The HRC um, defunded our project after 10 years. I don't blame them for doing so. They couldn't um, keep running the infrastructure project. But that showed how difficult it was for government to take over from the publishers. The job of the publishers had been doing reasonably well in our case for a century. Um, but by the same token, the sustainable and sustained income from journal subscription does provide kind of endless renewal of grants in a way that when it works well doesn't favor or disadvantage any particular parties. It taxes income to the point of publication, so it doesn't require that you have a grant or even any employment. A lot of the institutional discussion, a lot of discussions of the kind that Adam mentioned, um, uh, which are discussions between HEIs and, and UK government funders, um, are predicated on the assumption that between them, the UK government and the HEIs can handle all of the uh, scholarly communication in the UK. But it's not true. Half of my PhD students um, um, you know, don't get jobs within the first few years um, of uh, of, the, of the graduation. They don't have an institution. They're working in schools and hospitals and sometimes in museums and archives. Um, and uh, they, they do not have immediate access to um, HDI funds. Um, when Welcome says, um, thanks, that um, open access only costs it 1.5% of its budget, um, it's referring to a body of uh, researchers who are extremely well funded by Welcome and who have automatic access to Welcome funds for dissemination. But our UK has already decided it is not going to automatically fund um, uh, dissemination for its grants. And uh, the money that's flowing from our UK and, and maybe eventually from HEFI um, for open access will not go, will not be equally available to everyone. And those are the concerns that we are, we're worried about. Um, about, uh, I mean, Adam rightly says that managers don't wish to control where we publish, but if managers have the money to control where we publish, they will control where we publish. And the last um, principle, um, which I think flows naturally from this and from the lessons that we learned with our bibliography, is that open access requires plausible and sustainable business plans to provide the necessary income stream while promoting and sustaining academic quality and freedom. So if we can't rely on government, what are the alternatives? I don't think we can continue to rely on journals as they currently exist. Too many of them have shown themselves irresponsible and not only in STEM subjects. Informa, which publishes Taylor and Francis journals, registered in Jersey, domiciled in Switzerland, boasts in its annual reports of the spectacularly high shareholder value that its academic publishing division provides. And how many of us have even read those reports? Much uh, fewer of us. Um, uh, and uh, few, of, few of us, even who, who edit uh, Taylor and Francis journals, are not, have not very close to scrutinized or been able to scrutinize um, the, the cash flows within an operation. So we do need to put a lot of pressure on journals. Um, uh, not um, accepting um, APCs, which are designed to sustain publisher income. Um, oh, I got uh, coming to an end. And I, uh, <laughs> I got four more lines. Um, not APCs designed to sustain publisher income in the deals brought between the government and the publishers association, but green conditions um, designed to provide open access and sustain modern and defensible subscription rates 
for peer review, editing, reviewing, um, and dissemination, including improved transparency about where the subscription um, remedies go. And I think learned societies that publish with publishers, whether commercial or university presses, have a very strong focus on them now. To be completely transparent, they're claiming the profits go to good causes to show exactly how and where. We also, of course, need new journals um, de developed by consortia of libraries and universities, but not, again, in the control of any individual library or university, because that, again, um, gives um, managers too much control over um, where individuals publish. And, of course, lastly, above all, I think more urgently, even than journals, we need a, a, a new model for open access monograph publishing. I think Nigel Vincent's presentation was excellent in, in almost all respects actually underestimated the importance of, of monographs in humanities. Um, he used RAE ref a statistics sort of himself already massaged because until the current round, you have to submit four outputs. Um, and a book counted as much as an article, and so um, people um, submitted more articles than they would have uh, ordinarily ordinary submitted, more than they will submit this time around, where we have double data for some monographs. Um, so monographs are actually the most important means of scholarly dissemination of humanities. So they're the most broken, they're the most inaccessible, those book chapters might as well vary um, because they won't be read. The high school monographs as well, which are selling in, in 250, you know, living in very small number of libraries. It's absolutely desperate that we have an open access solution to monographs, but they're even more expensive, vastly more expensive than articles. And um, I'm delighted that Hefty has set up this monograph working. I think we should underestimate uh, what a sick task it has in front of it. Okay, um, so we'll move straight now to the front. That looks like so. Good morning, everybody. I'm assuming my slides are going to magically appear. You choose the. They were, sorry. Just oh, wait. <laughs> right. Okay, so um, I'm going to be as quick as I can. I've got a lot of slides, but I'll try and race through them. Um, I'm going to give you the perspective of a humanities researcher. Um, as was mentioned, I'm doing a part time PhD at UCL in biology. And also run Ubiquity Press, which is we set up um, from the perspective of researchers because we wanted to change publishing and, and have it search the interests of research uh, far more. And if you see the word science a lot on the slides, just replace it with academia or, or research. Um, for us, it's really, really, we really don't differentiate a great deal between the disciplines. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, from our perspective, about why we publish in the first place, um, why we think open access is important and exactly what it is, um, the licenses that we use, uh, especially the CC BY license, which is perhaps a little controversial in, in, in humanities and social sciences, uh, publishing, archiving, and and the benefits and disadvantages of this approach to publishing and whether it's appropriate for humanities and social sciences. And I'll, I'll go through a lot of the things I've heard where, where people have, have raised objections or had concerns and, and what my responses are. So this is the most popular slide in, in all publishing uh, conferences, the, the first journal ever published, um, the Royal Society Transactions in 1665. And the whole idea of beginning to publish was that we needed a new way of disseminating research efficiently so that um, the, the conversation within academia could be carried out efficiently. Um, so it's very important, it's what we would call the social contract of science, um, that if you, if, you, if you work within science or academia, you, you agree to disseminate your work to other people um, as widely as possible so they know what you're doing, um, so they can validate your work and, and, and the claims you're making, and that they can build upon your work, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, etc. It was very, very important, and, and we all agreed to take part in the system. This is why we peer review one another's work, um, why we have journals and books, arguably, in the first place. And there's something that um, Jeffrey Bolton from the Royal Society has said, which is that if we don't do this, it's basically scientific or academic malpractice. And it's quite a strong statement to make, but if we're not taking part in the system at its fullest, um, we're really not um, following the best principles of, of research and, and the academic uh, world we live in. And that applies to disseminating our results, so our papers and books, also the data we use, also within the humanities um, to um, create those works, and the software we use to, to process them. And that is very relevant in large parts of the social sciences and, and humanities as well. So 
because of this, I mean, if we really are going to have an efficient distribution mechanism um, which disseminates work as widely as possible, um, especially to people in the developing world who make up well over half of the researchers in the world, um, we need to use something. Um, our conclusion is open access is the only way to do this. Um, and exactly the form it takes is, is, the, is the next thing, really. So what is open access? Um, as we know, essentially, it's no barriers whatsoever to access or reuse. Um, and reuse is a very, very important um, word here, I think. So, and it's more carefully crafted definition from the Budapest Open Access Initiative. Um, it's, it's about and authors um, are properly attributed. But it's also about the fact that you can copy, use, distribute, transmit, display work publicly, make and distribute derivative work that works in any digital medium for any responsible purpose. It's very, very important that we don't stop this from happening. That we don't take halfway measures, we don't do what people might call free publication or free to read, etc. That we actually think about why these statements about open access were crafted in this way and, and why it's important that we are able to use these works in all of these ways. So, I mean, I would say text and data mining, for example, is hugely important. And it's not just in areas like uh, medicine and chemistry, I think it is very important in, in social sciences and humanities as well. And, I mean, we have a series of seminars which is held in this building, actually all throughout the, the academic year about the use of um, text and data mining in the classics, in the classic, classical studies and, and studies of the ancient world, for example, where scholar after scholar gets up and presents really interesting um, projects that they couldn't have done without access to a corpus of, of work. So the licenses involved, um, basically the three licenses which are most commonly, I'm sorry if they're not that, this, that point of this, this, the screen, um, are the Creative Commons licenses, um, usually CC by, uh, CC by non-commercial and CC by non-derivatives. If we're really going to have proper open access publishing which meets all of these criteria, then the CC by license does work, but the others don't. If, you, if you're going to restrict access through non-commercial um, um, restrictions, then you know, the majority of people in the country are not going to be able to reuse your work. Uh, charities, news organizations won't be able to reuse it either. And the same thing with non-derivative means you're not going to be able to do um, text and data mining and large amounts of uh, interesting work on that material. So really the CC BY license is the only one we have available to us for open access. Um, I just want to have a quick word about publishing and archiving. Um, so this, this whole unusual way we talk about open access as being gold or green, which is very, very misleading yeah. to me. Gold open access is what I would call publishing. Um, it's uh, the publisher makes content freely available. It's been through peer review and all, all the normal checks that you have with any other type of publishing, and often involves an author an article processing charge, but not always. In fact, 50% of, of journals don't charge one. Um, and that's as opposed to, to green open access, which really is archiving. It's not publishing at all. It's making a version of an article or a piece of work available in a repository somewhere or an archive. Um, quickly and immediately, and it's very important, but it's still not publishing it. They have the benefits of publishing that we all um, take for granted within academia. And if I'm, as a researcher, I want both of those things. I don't, I don't want one or the other. I want gold open access, and I then want, want everything to be automatically green archived as well. But I think if we push purely for, for green, we're also missing a really important trick right now, which is that as well as open access, we have a real opportunity right now to, to change the way publishing is done in academia. Um, publishing is hugely expensive. Um, libraries spend millions and millions on subscription deals. And right now, by, by moving to, to gold open access, we have a real opportunity to bring down the price of publishing. Um, and, and, and under gold open access, you only pay for the actual production of the article. You don't pay over and over and over again. And I think if we, if we let the opportunity through things like the Finch Report slip away, then we will end up with a still a very, very expensive system which is bankrupting university libraries and entire US states such as California, which is a bit extreme. Thing. Okay. So I'm just going to quick chat about some benefits. So often you hear about this within the humanities that CC BY specifically gets conflated with all sorts of things. It's not going to work well. Um, you hear that um, humanities research involves lots of copyright material and therefore it can't use CC BY. And this is a very important problem, and fair use and fair dealing are permitted, but I hope that's readable in orange, but they, they only go part of the way. Um, so what we really, really need is to start pushing for copyright exceptions for research, and also to encourage 
archives, for example, that have a lot of photographic material to release it under open access. We need to, we need to actually change the way that these materials are distributed. Um, but that is possibly the, the biggest problem um, for the humanities of CC BY. Um, people say they don't want um, their work to be translated without um, oversight and quality control. And that's also, I think, something of a misunderstanding. Okay. Um, that um, you have to, you have to um, attribute work in the manner specified by the author, and um, you, you cannot claim to, to, that, that that author endorses um, the way you use that work unless they, they agree to it. So you can't simply translate someone's work and, and imply that that's the way it was in, in the first place. Um, open access will increase the likelihood of plagiarism. Um, attribution is still required. Um, the author still retains copyright. Plagiarism is still just as bad as it is with subscription or any other license. Um, but in fact, plagiarism is much easier to detect when the, the material is available more widely. Uh, people talk about the fact that they might lose royalties if the book is available for free. Um, and it's still very early days for open access books, but current indications are that uh, royalties are stable and possibly even higher because the books are more well known. And uh, I think in any case, if you're only selling 200 or 400 copies of an academic book, you're not really taking part in the academic conversation, you're not part of the social contract. Um, some people say someone will create a derivative of my work and copyright it. Um, derivatives are allowed. Um, and if they're sufficiently original, they can be copyright protected. So it's a question of how original they are. Um, but this still doesn't affect the copyright of the original work. So, and there aren't very many cases of this having happened in, in a way that anyone would have complained about. Um, open access means low quality peer review. Um, is, and we've seen people trying to prove this through relatively dubious means lately in this, this open access sting article and so forth. Um, peer review is completely independent of the distribution system or mechanism such as open access. So CC BY, and we have it in the in the STM where uh, peer review has has been questioned because of open access. And so why would it happen in the humanities? Uh, we also hear citation metrics won't work in the humanities, and we would just say why not? Um, citation metrics themselves are very problematic um, in all fields, but um, just because half lives are longer in, in the humanities doesn't mean that you can't simply look at these things in context and interpret them appropriately. Uh, I've heard, I read a couple of papers in preparation to this where the words were used that open access is a threat to academic freedom, which were, I found relatively astounding, um, because it clearly increases freedom in many areas. Um, mandates don't have to restrict authors to certain journals, and, and publishers really need to adapt and provide open access options. This is where the problem is. And finally, open access is too expensive for the humanities. I must stop. High fees and double dipping need to be discouraged, etc. So. I just wanted to say very briefly that fees don't have to be high, and, and, and you can have transparency. So we, we've managed to bring our costs down to 250 pounds per article. And on our website, we're very clear about exactly where the money goes and what it's for. So it is possible to publish open access at low cost and transparently. And there are huge amounts of benefits um, that result as well. I think the benefits massively outweigh any of those concerns, which um, generally can be worked around um, pretty easily. Thank you. Terrific. Uh, thanks very much. Um, and I suggest that we go straight on to Charlotte. Okay, thank you. Um, next, my focus is going to be on the CCC Y license. Um, I'm going to touch on four areas. I'm going to look at what the license covers. I'm going to distinguish between copyright infringement and plagiarism, which has been touched on by two speakers already. I'm going to speak briefly about the place and role of moral rights. And I'm going to mention enforcement. But I do want to make a preliminary point, and this is about the Finch Report. In the Finch Report, copyright is mentioned on 11 pages, a total of 14 times. And that's in connection with things like an exception for text mining, um, the advantages of digitization for out of copyright books, and um, that copyright is an impediment to the digitization of work still protected, including local works. And funders and institutional policies which require deposit in compliance with copyright and licensing arrangements, among a couple of other points. Um, my point is that the copyright framework was built around publishing. The first act of 1709 was built as one to um, regulate uh, publishing in part. Um, and I was really surprised not to see more about copyright in the French report, given that it's the foundation on which the publishing industry is constructed. Um, I understand that it was because copyright didn't 
actually not actually part of the remit of the French group. But the fact that it wasn't has possibly um, resulted uh, in what the Bids Committee said on their report uh, in their report on Open Access. Um, widespread concern, uncertainty, and confusion in relation to corporeal rights and how they should govern the open access um, landscape. And of course, the discussion about the CCBY license is part of that. So, what does the CCBY license cover? In essence, you, you as a person who's written your academic article, grants a worldwide, royalty free, non exclusive, exclusive, contextual license to your work. And that allows anybody else to reproduce the work, to adapt it, to distribute it, to publicly perform it, and to communicate it however uh, they would like. Now, as we all know, copyright is really fuzzy at the edges. Um, when do you infringe copyright? When, when is, there, is, is a copy an infringement of copyright? Well, it's very hard to tell because an infringement of copyright is both um, quantitative, but in particular it's qualitative. So you can't point to something and say that is definitively an infringement. Equally fuzzy are the edges around fair dealing. Um, so, for example, how many lines can you quote of somebody else's work before you have to ask permission or pay for it? Um, what does uh, research for non-commercial purposes actually mean in the context of being a corporate commercial? So your CCBY license takes away all these uncertainties uh, by virtually placing the work in the public domain to allow people to do virtually what they want with it. However, of course, in the humanities and social sciences, there are um, problems, or there are, there are issues that arise. Um, one of them is with the many layers of copyright that might be encompassed in um, an article or a text of, you know, or, or a, a, a monograph if you go on to that sort of work. So in other words, in, in our disciplines, we often reproduce work of others with permission, um, uh, whether it be images, text, paper, data, that word advisedly, images, um, text, or um, other third-party material for which we need a license. So your CCBY license is not going to cover this third-party material, which can only be used to the extent that permission is given to use it to the original author. So your, your user at that point might be looking at um, a, a work that is made available by open access and say, well, I'm with this under the CCBY license, and say, well, which bits can I actually use? I'm not quite sure. And equally, that causes, that could cause problems for the academic, because of course you've got, you've, you've got your scholarly article, you've got permission to use your third party materials for a particular purpose, and that may well not include um, a CCBY license making it, uh, make it available under open access in school. So, in other words, you might have to carve out the bits for which you've got permission for specific purposes, but not, um, not made available to you, let's say, um, in, a, in an open access repository or on the internet. So a little bit of a problem, potentially, there. Um, lots of concern I've heard um, in the community about the fact that um, the CCBY allows commercial re reuse. Um, and it is, I understand, a worry for a lot of participants. And I would actually like to call this apart a little bit, because I'm, I'm not quite sure um, I understand fully what people's concerns here are. I have heard dark mutterings about the Chinese taking of intellectual property rights and copyright and patent here, but are they? Well, what are they doing? I'm not quite sure. Um, but we do have to remember that there are a lot of different ways in which works um, under a CCB white license might be um, made available commercially. One example is a playwright, the right to play. Under a CCB white license, somebody else would take that and then, without permission from the, from the uh, author of the playwright, actually have it performed on stage. Another example might be where um, your, your article is taken and placed in a collection. And you then perhaps have some um, added value in terms of that particular search engine and then made available on some commercial means. There's lots of different ways in which uh, commercial can operate, and I would be very interested just to pull that um, apart a little bit. Um, CCBY then is very wide license, which brings me on to think because there seems to be a concern in the community that CCBY will encourage political code plagiarism. And I want to make a few points in response to that. Um, I and mean, when people talk about plagiarism, it seems to be conflated with, with copyright infringement. Now, sometimes copyright infringement is plagiarism, and sometimes uh, plagiarism is copyright infringement, but the two are not <coughs> the same thing. They have different historical 
and they seek to do two different things. Plagiarism is created based on fraud. It's based on bad faith or covetousness, in other words, wanting to hide. It's about claiming the work of somebody else as your own. In other words, it's about stealing ideas. And the copyright infringement is based around something that's a substantial part of somebody else's work. Um, and copyright infringement can only occur in relation to the expression of the work, not the ideas, because ideas are not protected by copyright. Ideas, however, can be plagiarized. Um, copyright liability is one strict liability, so you don't have to know that you're actually infringing copyright in order to be liable. Plagiarism, on the other hand, given the element of fraud or perverseness, tends to suggest that plagiarists know what they're doing. Um, copyright infringement can only occur in relation to work that's actually protected by copyright. So, um, if you have, um, if you can, however, um, a work in the public domain, maybe because it's no longer protected, it can, however, be plagiarised. And finally, and um, a point that has been made, plagiarism depends on being able to hide. And with more move towards open access, um, then there is less chance to actually find. And I think what is really needed in terms of plagiarism is much more um, an education of the uh, community, which I understand does happen in schools and colleges and universities, about what plagiarism is and why it's wrong, and that plagiarism and copyright should not be related. And there's also the requirement um, under the CCB wide license for attribution, which of course a plagiarist would never actually but there is a requirement for attribution under the CCP wide license. Um, and what it is, is that the name of the original author must be attached to the work, along with the title of the work, and that reasonable means must be used to make, to, to make sure that those are attached. You can't, however, control modification or adaptation, but if something is modified or is adapted, the license says um, you should say something like the original work was translated from English to Spanish, or that a modification could indicate the original work being modified, it was still no much further than that to say, well, what is the modification? Um, also, um, an author cannot, if a, if, a, if a work is put in a collection or a modification is made, the author cannot for the name to be removed. But there's no mechanism, as far as I can see, in the license for the person who makes the modification to tell the author that they've modified it. So it depends on the author finding out. So the, the process is perhaps not as good as it could be. Um, there is also the right in the license to object to derogatory treatment. Um, and in particular, you must not distort, mutilate, modify, or take other derogatory actions in relation to the work which would be prejudicial to the original author's honor or reputation. Um, which is, is um, in line with the moral rights that we have in this country under our copyright act, which are rather narrow, um, or not, they, they tend to be called timid rights, um, but nonetheless they do, they do exist. But I think the key question here again is to what extent these moral rights would be enforceable. And of course, given that it's us, it's the author, it's the academic who wants the license, it would be for the author to take action in order to enforce them. And that may not be very easy for an academic author. So, CCB wide is called license, um, yeah. giving you wide permission on what can be done. Um, in my views, it does not condone the cult uh, or in any way plagiarism. Um, there is the protection for moral rights for regime, but enforcement would be difficult. And my final question is we've talked about school of the articles, we've talked about monographs, what about all the other types of works? that are our colleagues in humanities and social sciences now make available. Why aren't they out there or even being discussed in the um, open access space? Sure, uh, thank you very much. So what I'd like, what I'd like to do is rather than um, have the <coughs> panel talking amongst themselves, I'd like to take uh, questions and comments uh, from anybody in the room. I believe we have a roving pair of roving mics going around. So, um, can you signal any, any questions you have? And when you speak, could you say uh, who you are as well, please? Uh, <coughs> Thank you. My name is William Sinclair. I'm an academic author. Um, and for years, I worked uh, as a practicing economist. Uh, I'm also chairman of Open Book Publishers, which has been sustained for five years now, publishing uh, monographs of the humanities, now some brochures which have been distributed. I just wanted to make two points. Much of the things that were said I agree with. 
Now, first of all, the figures that are being, have been quoted for the cost of publishing a book, 18,000 euros, as mentioned. The other day we had 12,000 euros in the... These are way out from our experience. They're about... It's possible in modern circumstances to publish a book for a quarter of that amount. The second point I want to make is the notion that there is something called the government and then something called the market. It's, uh, it, it's, it doesn't really apply in the area we're talking about. So that when we talk about library subscriptions as different from grants from, uh, from a body or from an institution, these are all the same amount. They're just money moved from one public expenditure pocket to another public expenditure pocket. And we know that the whole uh, higher education system is a transfer from those at margin on less than average income to those on much more than average income. It's a transfer from the poor to the rich, and you can defend that. Whether you can defend going doing more of that which is what the Finch report seems to be suggesting, at a time when cheaper alternatives are available, I rather doubt. And that it's not just a moral question, but that no government which is responsive to the people in a wide sense, which is democratic, would want to do that. If you take the totality of the costs of producing research, publishing it, having it engaged with, there are huge net savings to be made, and it ought to be open to the public, to the uh, university sector, to bring those about. It's, it's an administrative matter which you can do if you do the economics properly. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Terrell and then Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thanks. So, I'm Terrell Carver from the um, University of Bristol Politics and International Studies, also the uh, Political Studies Association in the UK and the International Political Science Association, one of the executive committees. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Vincent and the panel um, for a session that's really been quite uh, clarifying and it's rather confirmed me in my view that there are two quite different debates going on here. Um, and a certain kind of political process. Um, one debate is about open access, what it is, um, and all of that. And so I'm also as a journal editor, contemporary political theory was part of um, And this seems to me to be eminently part of an ordinary market consumer, product, profit, governmental, um, whatever sort of push-pull process. It's, uh, really doesn't need to bother anybody that much unless they're particularly involved. What really does bother me, and I'll explain why, is uh, the situation, as Professor Vincent uh, outlined it, um, with uh, the differential impact that the RC UK and Hefke uh, blunt instrument, uh, as I'll call it, uh, will have on the research assessment um, processes that we put ourselves through in this country. But it is about a year ago at the Academy of uh, Social Sciences, RC UK and Hefty announced, uh, and so um, Dave Jones uh, herself nodded, that they, they were determined to use the research assessment uh, process to push through. Uh, this supposed principle and practice further along in UK academic life than it had gone uh, before. Now, this is a very blunt instrument which Professor Vincent uh, has uh, shown us. It's uh, in uh, the form that it's coming through, even with modifications, uh, applies in different subject areas in uh, quite different kinds of ways. And of course, it's going to shape the future in terms of uh, output and career. Now, my point about that is that the UK is well known to about well above um, its uh, um, supposed position in the International League table in exactly these subjects, not least through being Anglophone and being a very leading uh, Anglophone uh, source of knowledge and information 
uh, output and uh, all that comes, indeed, as uh, Professor Vincent uh, has shown. So I think uh, Professor Vincent put his finger on it when he said the research assessment process had previously been based on quality, however it was that different panels wanted to uh, interpret that in their different ways, and that some panels uh, had a very inclusive uh, idea about what was going to uh, count uh, as published, such that it could be subjected to a quality assessment. So this very blunt instrument is basically um, trying to get those panels to narrow down what it is they're going to assess for qualities, and that will drive down the credibility such as it has nationally and internationally of the research um, assessment process altogether. So um, essentially it might be fine to talk about transparency or open access, but this is going to shoot some areas of UK um, scholarship from very much in the foot internationally and be very counterproductive. Or to put it the other way, as a uh, research manager myself, I have to turn to people and have uh, had to for a number of years and say, look, if you persist with your book chapters in American collections uh, or your monograph with uh, OUP and don't produce more uh, than four articles in ever better quote unquote journals, which would now have to uh, satisfy other sorts of extraneous requirements, which may be uh, entirely foreign to them, um, you're not going to get your promotion and you'll be on performance monitoring. So I think there's something really sinister there, something that's really very quite nationalistic, and something that's um, driven by what I would call actually bullying from RCUK and healthy, and I, I don't actually quite see what they're going to get out of it, um, except to go on this political campaign. Now, Professor Tickell told us that the percentage of referable uh, items could be quite low in terms of that open access, but obviously it could be quite high. So thank you. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'll take comments from me and then I'm going to invite them to the panel to come back on comments and then just take another group of uh, questions. Hi, I'm Ian. Um, I work in a journal called Elite. I build things for researchers. You'll hear more about that later. I'd like to thank Professor Belder for your summary on licenses. I thought it was fantastic and clear, covered a lot of the topics. I wanted to make two comments. Um, so the first comment is this issue about licenses not covering the material that uh, researchers are reusing. I think it is a critical issue. It's very important. Um, it relates to a topic that a lot of us in the open science movement have been talking about, where, where we, call, we call it the tragedy of the commons, where you try and incentivize people to move to a more open system, but unless everybody moves at the same time, that causes a bit of friction. However, I think there's hope. I think um, over time, those copyrights will expire, and that problem hopefully should recede. And I think if you can find pockets of uh, research where open access becomes embedded, those pockets can, can kind of crystallize and, and, and form little networks where, it, where those, that problem is reduced over time. But it is a really critical issue, and I thank you for raising it. The second comment I want to make is about the nature of the CC BY versus CC BY NC license. I just want to give an example of how CC by NC can be can, can lead to unintended consequences. There was an example recently of a, somebody who published an article of CC by NC with their, with their publisher, with published open access. They wanted to reuse that content uh, in their lecture notes. The publisher charged $125 to do so because that was considered to be commercial reuse. And so those kind of incentives and uh, uh, distorted uh, outcomes fall down on both sides of the fence in that debate. And I think it's important to realize that. So those are the two comments I wanted to make. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Would you like to come back to the um, When David uh, Mannering asked me to speak on this uh, uh, panel, I said I wouldn't talk about CC BY because I felt that it was uh, too dull and too technical. And actually, everyone was um, uh, speaking across purposes, but I feel I have to intervene now because that, I, uh, it's not, it's not a, a simple matter. Um, I mean, Charlie gave an extremely lucid account, but it was slightly tilted towards one interpretation. And believe me, I've talked to lots and lots of lawyers about CC BY, about what it does and doesn't do. And um, actually, there are lots of different interpretations, including within CC itself. And in fact, when we started out this debate about applicability of open access to humanities, um, CC initially took a 
kind of rather absolutist stance based on its experience with the sciences. And it said, oh, well, TC by is the only license. Um, it's, it's the definition that, um, uh, that was put up on, uh, uh, on the, the screen of open access by Brian. And so we were sticking by that. But over time, actually, TC has said to me, every one of the senior lawyers at TC has said to me, we, we haven't had much experience with humanities and social science. We see that actually TC by has different effects humanities and social science that it had in science. And we actually think you're quite right. You probably do need a new kind of license. And I'll just give you two reasons why. One is um, that it's not the case that the CC BY is the only license um, that will allow text mining. The kind of text mining um, that takes place in the humanities can be done under almost any CC license. And again, I've been at meetings of techie people and lawyers, high class, high class people, and you say that, and half of them say, yes, you're right. And half of them say, no, you're wrong. And um, both happy and welcome said they're going to go and wait and do some research. Uh, on this question, and um, you know, there are obviously technical issues which uh, need to be resolved by experts, but it's not clear cut. There's not a single answer, so um, it's not the case that we need CC by for text mining. Um, secondly, um, plagiarism. Now, this is an extremely complicated and emotive question, and perhaps I shouldn't use the word plagiarism in my discussion. Frankly, and I'm talking now as a teacher. I hope every teacher in this room will recognize what I'm saying. The kind of plagiarism that we tell our students they must not engage in. It's not the thing where they don't attribute, um, because they don't always try to hide their plagiarism. Um, they're doing it kind of innocently. It's, it's where they mix their words with our own and don't specify which are their words and which are our words. It's, it's, I mean, you, you, if it's not plagiarism, I don't know what it is. We call that plagiarism in my university. Let's find another word for it. But that's the thing that the CC by license permits, indeed encourages, indeed, as some of the enthusiasts have recently been arguing, um, propagandizes for. But actually, um, cloaking your words in mine gives an, in, uh, gives an improper um, account of my words and also gives your words a kind of dignity and a value that they don't necessarily deserve. That's why we tell our students you must never do this. You've got to learn how to write for yourself. You can't do some of my words and some of yours and mix them up together. And again, CC says, yes, you're right. CC by does allow that. It probably shouldn't for your purposes. And you need a new license. And so I'm saying, well, please, if you write in license, and they say, well, it's not high on our priorities, because really we're still mostly dealing with science. They don't care about this. So uh, the blog that was attached to this conference, uh, there was a lawyer, one of your colleagues from LSE, who said, that's a very good idea. Let's have a new license. It's not to five. It'll be something else. And it'll, it'll prevent the kind of plagiaristic practices which many scholars, I think, are rightly concerned about, and which weren't covered, I think, by Charlotte's otherwise extremely comprehensive and lucid presentation. Thank you. John. Uh, I guess my, um, I'm not, you yeah, shouldn't, you shouldn't say that this discussion is about this issue, but I guess the one thing I'd say is, um, what about the scholarly norms and the role of norms in, in, uh, in, in addressing patients rather than just the law that's in the copy? No, I don't want to explain why, why make me issue my work under a, a license? Indeed, as I say, propaganda is by propaganda as a practice, which my trial and norms that are that say are, 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 are bad practices. Let me publish my open access work under a license, which requires the user, the reuser, to show which are their words and which are my words. That's all I have to say. I think I think uh, um, uh, is is commensurate with that requirement. No, it's not. It's really not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, at the risk of um, fifty cups. <laughs> And just a couple of things. Just a couple just a couple of points. Um, uh, you make you make a point that this is saying um, that you know, we should get to the university where um, uh, copyright is higher and so they can be used and uh, and reused. Uh, but of course copy copyright does um, last for a long enough time, 70 years after death of the author, and then we have all the problems about the copyright and things like this. So it would be nice to think of it as being a where you know, things would be to be used, but it, it, it's not necessarily um, uh, it's, it's not it's not around the corner by any means. Um, the other one is around the data mining, which has been which has been mentioned um, an awful lot. How C C Y is allowed to test data data uh, test data mining, which it clearly wouldn't do. But of course, the government is uh, has pledged to produce um, an exception to the right around text and data mining uh, in any. So you know, it should be there in due course in our general rules around data mining. 
And I actually agree. I think it's a move. And I think I hope to talk before I go on now to say this. But I do think it's a move for academic roles and our community roles that we need to can and can't be done with these things. Okay, I'm going to, going to go back to Paul now. Um, first person is a woman at the back. Yes. Well, I'm going to continue the discussion on this point. I'm the lawyer from NSA that you mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, but you're, you're citing me wrongly, <laughs> actually. Um, I wasn't saying, uh, you're, you're quite right, there is a problem, in, a particular problem in humanities and social sciences with um, taking work and modifying it, making the argument subtly different the second time around, the second user's hands, and what I was saying that it's in the e-collection was that we perhaps need a license that um, requires the licensee to say how they have modified. The That's exactly what I said. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, but that doesn't. That isn't an injunction on the licensee not to plagiarize in your sense, in your specific sense. For that, we need these scholarly norms that, that Charlotte and Jonathan were talking about, and we can't, I think, be trying to enforce those scholarly norms through a license. Agreed. We need a license that requires people to show how they have modified work, but we don't need a license that requires them not to plagiarize in any of the senses that you're talking about. And I, I want to make a point here that, that may be controversial, but it comes back to what Jonathan was saying earlier as well, about the, the nature of the scholarly conversation. And Brian mentioned it too, you know, the idea of the Republic of Scholars as inclusive, as being as inclusive as possible. But the point of including as many people as, as possible, and the point of having as many conversations as possible, is to advance collective public knowledge. It's not to be able, for one person to be able to put their hand up and say, I produced that genius idea. This is a communal endeavor. And I'm not too worried about, you know, whether any individual can put their name on a good idea and say, that belongs to me. As long as the ideas are developing, I, I think we need to lose our preciousness as humanities and social science scholars a little about who exactly said what, right? Um, and I know this cuts against the grain of, of what we've been acculturated into as academics, you know, intense egoism, intense individualism. But we've got to remember that that is part of our conditioning as as career as career academics who have a lot to gain from having every single thing we've ever achieved cited and attributed to us. I think we need to let go of that a little bit. And to that extent, we can learn a lot from remix culture. Uh, we can, you know, worry about some of it dumbing down to propensities, but still, I think we can learn a lot from it as well. Yes. Yeah, so. Um John wants to make one comment, and then I'm going to turn to Nigel. Maybe you're not talking about licenses, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to um, affect the discussion. Also. So I guess one thing I'm saying is to take the case of material which is out of copyright, historical material <coughs> in public domain. I guess my question would be, given that there's a reasonable expectation that both among scholars and among students, um, that material is not plagiarized, it's not completed correctly, it's attributed correctly, Normally, when you're writing about an academic journal, you wouldn't mix your own words with the person who's written that thing, which is no longer under legal, under, under it's no longer protected by copyright. There's an extra text you use it correctly and show which ones are your words and which words are their words. My question is do we really need to invoke the law to, to, to make sure that sort of the use of material which is after copyright is used in a way which is, which is fair? And I think partly um, you know, it's the basis of scholarship to check whether those attributions and those interpretations are correct. It's not just a legal issue that requires computers but reach 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 to the and pull the lock. It's also and that's part of what scholarship is, is checking, you know, are you, how have you described that thing correctly? Have you made the advocacy from your interpretation of that thing? <coughs> so I'm sorry, I'd say it is a bit more complicated. There are things beyond the law which are required. Okay, thanks. Um uh, Mike is coming. Oh. One was just a point about what was said down here because I, I really wasn't trying to criticise Ref or RE. What I was, all I wanted to say was that I think the principle that they work on is peer review. The data I had at the beginning is simply using the public domain RE 2000 data as the source of some information. So it wasn't a discussion about um, 
how ref panels work or anything like that. And in fact, it's interesting to note when you look at the details for the ref panels, not even ref main panel A uses impact factors. The A and B use citation indices. C is cautious about citation indices, and D won't use either citation indices or impact factors. So the role of bibliometrics is very different there. But I don't really want to talk about licenses, but I do want to talk a bit more about text and data mining. I think it's very important that we get much more precise in this conversation. So text mining is very different from data mining, because the data sets tend to come in pre-structured things that you can compare pretty directly. And by and large, that's what the natural scientists want. I was at a panel in, in Leeds a few months ago, and Alma Swan said publicly, well, of course, it's publishing papers is the wrong thing, because the structure of the writing the paper isn't what we want. We want access to the data in some other kind of way. You could almost see the philosophers falling off the chair of the idea that they didn't publish words. Um, and it's the moment you get into text mining where what matters isn't keyword searching. Because text mining that searches for individual words is relatively easy and straightforward. Text mining that actually unpacks the syntax of complex sentences is a very different kind of piece. Uh, the other point I make in relation to Brian is a lot of those things that you're talking about in digital humanities, what people are searching are corpuses of uh, historical texts, archives, classical literature. They're not searching corpuses of the secondary literature. So if I, which I do, occasionally search Latin texts and quote so Cicero, I'm quick quoting Cicero because he used the subjunctive in that clause and I, because I'm sad, I think that's really fantastic. But I'm not challenging what Cicero said about old age or whatever. And, and I think we need, in talking about digital humanities, which is an important development, to distinguish between digital searches of corporal materials from text mining as understood in the biomedical world, which is digital searches of the secondary literature. Yes. Um. Sorry. Um, Casey Branza, I'm a lecturer in publishing and digital media at City University of London. And I was really intrigued by this the invocation that I've heard, I don't know how many times now, at least four or five, um, related to scholarly norms and how scholarly norms are somehow going to govern how you know, scholarly research is used under an open access regime of some sort. But isn't the point of an open access regime to open it up to the, the world who may or may not share our norms. And what then, and I would invite the panelists or anyone else to think about whether or not there are unintended consequences to this. Thank you. I've got uh, there are a couple of questions. So, uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, that the battery is back. Um, my name is Tom Rivers. I'm um, copyright person. Um, I, I was rather startled to hear from about Rome from the LSC lawyer about how it was precious to want to have your name attached to uh, your materials, since that is one of the moral rights included in the Berne Convention. Uh, it doesn't seem to me to be precious, it just seems to me to be one of our international obligations. Um, it's also <coughs> thinking about moral rights, of course not the case that uh, moral rights are the same the world over. Uh, the moral rights that we have in the United Kingdom are relatively thin by comparison with moral rights that are enjoyed in continental Pueblo systems. Um, and I think that may very well be problematic if we're trying to think of um, making open access norms which are being devised in uh, a UK system uh, exportable to the rest of, of the world. I mean, for example, one of the issues uh, thinking about moral rights still, is that effectively moral rights don't exist in the United States, because they uh, explicitly accepted 
uh, Article 6, I think it is, of the Berne Convention from incorporation in their domestic legislation, aside from in relation to works of finance. Um, I want to make a quite different point uh, about what open access is for. There is, of course, um, a government agenda which has to do with deregulation and making uh, and monetizing uh, intellectual property. In that context, it seems to me to be very peculiar that the focus should be on copyright, because copyright, thinking of it as a tradable good, is actually much less valuable and patents. Um, I would be very interested to hear from the panelists or from anyone else in the hall why it is that copyright should be the subject of open access and patents should be uh, ignored. Is it just because patents have a much stronger lobby? Uh, is it because they are much more valuable? Uh, perhaps someone can tell us. Uh, but not immediately. I'm going to go to the question. Uh, hello, my name is Chris Slake. I'm the in Business Librarian at the University of Oxford. Um, I have heard once before at an open data session uh, an idea similarly expressed to the one that was just there about people not being too precious. Um, in claiming ownership of certain ideas which ought to be able to flow freely and be merged and added to and, and involved within a community, sort of like a flux of, of information that can be shed on. Um, I think it would be a very sad world if consumers of information lost the ability to be able to connect ideas with individual people. Um, to understand with whom they are having a conversation with, even if they don't know the person directly. Um, I think it's important to be able to appreciate the, the words that people use, whereby they, uh, they express the ideas in the manner they choose to express them. I think it's important to be able to, if you wish, delve into the way people evolve their ideas over the time. So I think the ownership of ideas by individuals who express them is something we should be very careful not to throw away. Uh, thank you. Are there any more uh, questions to the floor? We've got about 10 minutes left um, before we stop lunch. So I'm going to go to the panel, but if there are any other questions or comments that you'd like to make. OK. Um, no, uh, I'll, I'll go. I'm happy to relate. <coughs> Um, well, I want to, sorry. Um, I want to rephrase uh, something that I said at the beginning. I mean, just repeat it really, um, because I think it, it um, addresses the CCI issues again, but also the other issues which I'm, I'm sad that we haven't actually given enough attention to. As I say, I think the, the crucial question. I hope later in this day we will talk more about it. Are coming up with successful business models for open access, especially for monographs, but. Um, just to rephrase uh, something that I started out with, um, I have gotten involved in this discussion, and I've spent a huge amount of the last year uh, working on it. Um, not because I was against open access, but because I was in favor of open access, and I was worried that the Finch Report and, gov and governments rather the precipitate adoption of it based on STEM models advised by people like Haas and Welcome, who had only experience with STEM publishing, I was worried that those recommendations would be would discredit open access in humanities and social sciences. And actually, I'm afraid that my worst concerns have been confirmed in that respect, although I also am very pleased that Hefke in particular has listened to a lot of our concerns and has started to respond to them in its consultation of replying um, open access to the rep. And the, 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 the key point here is that um, UK is a funny place um, in, the, in the world um, order where governments bring less and less money into higher education, but requiring more and more from it, and it has an effect on academics. And we have to be careful when we um, adopt a new regulatory regime that they don't have uh, unintended consequences, which I think RAE and REF has had. Some of them good, some but a lot of them bad. I say that as someone who like Nigel Vincent has been very involved in RAE and REF. And I just think we have to be concerned that, that open access doesn't have the same effect. And as far as this applies to CC BY, um, 
our position was initially, as it was, as it was about gold, that um, gold and CC BY were not the only way of switching to open access, despite what various enthusiasts from the physics community and the maths community decided in Budapest four years ago. I'm, not, I'm sorry, that's not a kind of holding text. We have to rewrite those texts and consider what open access is for us. And so gold and CC BY are not the only way to do it, and I don't see why we should um, precipitately impose gold and CC BY on academics if we if, we're, if the possibility is that the, the disadvantages will outweigh the advantages. Um, and you know, as, as I've got to be seen, there is actually a great dis deal of disagreement about the effect of CC BY on text mining, um, and a great deal of disagreement of CC BY on um, uh, on plagiarism. Um, and you know, as I say, I'm happy to have, have listened to these concerns, and they've moved their position. So has created comments. Um, and these are these are not amateurs who, who misunderstand <laughs> the uh, the situation of the humanities uh, uh, and. Still left with it and misunderstand um, how um, open access licensing works. Um, but you know, the, the, we've been having a discussion, and the, they've been shifting our positions, and we've been shifting our positions. And we, we really shouldn't be reverting. And I've been worried to hear some of this reversion here to a kind of absolutist view, which is that the open access has been done by scientists two years ago. So the only way to do you know, I'll just say one last thing. Lawrence Lessig, founder of Creative Commons, prophet of the open access movement, has put in his book. Manifesto for Open Access Free Culture Online on a CC BY NC license. He's not misunderstanding either of that means. I, I thought I, I would respond to the, the question about um, the unintended consequences of opening up content to people in the world who don't follow story norms. So in the UK, I guess that includes um, the commercial sector. Who technically speaking are paying the taxes to fund the universities to fund the research to be done in the first place. So I think one unintended uh, consequence there is actually economic growth. Um, and it's, it's a certain amount of fairness that, that people within the, uh, the rest of the company the country are able to benefit from the, the research that they're funding. I think the, the unintended consequences of that are actually quite um, quite startlingly really positive. Um, at the same time, um, you know, areas such as citizen science and so forth are a hugely developing field, citizen research, and uh, we should really um, embrace these, these fields. And the ability of people within the, the education system, in, in schools, etc., to, to reuse material that's being produced in universities, <coughs> is, um, there's huge potential there. And I, I think we can't guess the ways which people will reuse that material. We certainly shouldn't be shutting them out. Um, the only thing that I, I'm interested in as well is, is that the fact that we're incorporating large parts of the world that have a different cultural understanding of copyright and of plagiarism. And we see that now with a lot of students in these parts of the world coming to universities and, and approaching these issues in different ways. I think we need to, it's going to be a conversation or a development over the next decade or so of us trying to shift our position on what is appropriate and what's not appropriate according to us for the norms that the majority of people in the world come from communities that have different norms. And I don't think there's an easy answer as to whether our position is better than theirs necessarily. And all these licenses and, and so forth we'll have to reflect that over time. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, um, yeah, just, um, I, was, I was reflecting on the, on the comment about um, the CCPY being used to find uh, particular films of projected licenses being used by people to be on the stock of the community and what kind of stock of the community there. And you're absolutely right, of course, the, the license does only uh, work worldwide. And I was just sitting there reflecting to myself, well, um, if my work is under this particular wide license, um, I would actually not want my name to be attributed across property to, to, many, to many works that are made. I would have like a happy to have uh, my work used in many different ways. But I really will not want my, my name to be um, actually um, attributed to the ways in which the work is used, which perhaps brings us up to a slightly different interpretation of the of the argument that you know people should be colored into knowledge and not necessarily be wanting to stamp our names on um, uh, um, examples of how it how it actually goes to the surface. Um, and just to come back to comment briefly on Tom's point, why uh, why why is copyright <coughs> my job pattern? Um, uh, well, we're a lot into patterns, I think, you know, the, the final comment that I make is, is why, why are we sort of doing questions and now um, talk about um, monographs, why not all the other innovative 
wonderful types of outputs that the output that the Manchester Social Sciences scholars actually develop using public funding. And I mean, I don't have a full answer to that. I just have a, I just have various um, sort of ideas. But it's an incredibly complex um, ecosystem um, in which this, the, the digital objects, digital public objects, or the credit word or films or whatever, are actually um, developed and then made available to um, a, to the, the ultimate user of them. And some of those actually um, are very explicitly now resting on some form of commercial exploitation, for example. You know, how, can, how does public funding move from um, the point of funding to um, the digital economy? And you know, how might it be exploited in the, in the, creative, the, the creative digital economy? Um, and that, of course, um, doesn't sit that happily um, with um, necessarily an open access approach to all of the, all of the outputs. But that's only really just a, a stab in the dark at something that's um, incredibly complex, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess, first of all, um, just to, to, to reiterate um, what I kind of tried to do, I guess, uh, in my talk, which is to emphasise the fact that open access is a property of different parts and aspects of our common scholarly communication system. It's not just a wholesale change in what scholarly appears and how it works. I think that entails that it does not necessarily change um, things like peer review, attitudes, plagiarism, standards, the way we create effects. I think it's, it's a very important point. I guess, more generally, also, my talk was trying to see that. Um, address what I think would be a dangerous imbalance against open access in, in terms of confusing the broader breadth of open access with a particular way it's been implemented by the government through its policy. Uh, I just basically I think I want to make sure that people see that the principle of open access isn't irreparably tarnished by debates about um, UK policy implementation and, and indeed broader higher education policy in the UK. And we shouldn't think of open access as a fanatic front per se, nor we should think of it as neoliberal deregulation of tackle scholarship. And it doesn't demand naive that it's very important. And I guess the other important so on one hand, you know, don't give access to something don't give access to complete body on the other hand, I think and I'm really glad to see this other side that this sort of open access in a way which enables I think in fact so another thing is to make sure that um, Scholars engage with debates about um, uh, this process of recomposition, which is inevitable in, in many fields. You know, recomposition in broader sense, not just in relation to open access, but how our scholarly landscape is changing in the 21st century. And to engage in that process at national institutional level and in, in their fields, and to make sure we strike the right balance between sustainability and access, which of course is a political issue, partly, but better to make sure we engage with it. I think emphasizing again that open access does not have to be. An absolutist or idealist stance on this. And briefly, the question about past is yes, we do need to be able to write something that's relevant for. Just also kind of going back to the question on does open access actually mean that you know, anything goes effectively? Um, I think it's important to remember that um, uh, scholarly communities don't, even if you know, the law changes or policies change, scholarly communities aren't going to suddenly drop standards. And we need to, we need to understand the implications of this. Policy in the context of how scholarly communities actually function. It's not likely to decrease tolerance when we uh, towards things like misattribution claims or bad structure. Just because policy changes doesn't mean that's the change where people read and write, interpret, debate, and argue about texts. Uh, I think the final point, which I think is really, really important, is that we do also look at open access, question about open access, within the context of broader politics of uh, policies around. Um, the higher education system, how it's funded, uh, and, and, and how it works, and how it um, should work in order to support the, the kind of um, scholarly system we want to see community to Okay, uh, thanks all very much. I'm just going to make a couple of closing remarks, and then I promise you, you're going to have your Yorkshire sandwiches or whatever. I think one of the really interesting things about this, this session, um, and about the whole morning, really, is that the degree of um, Consensus that open access to the research that we do is a a quite a good thing. I think there's much hostility, and I think Peter very uh, very properly made the point that right from the outset um, the question was about how we do it, not why, whether or why we should do it. And I think we need to remember that in the messaging because we're not just talking to ourselves; we're talking to a broader community 
And sometimes when we say things, then it is heard in, in this that we are opposed to open access. So I think we need to be very clear, as I think Nigel and Peter were both very clear, that it isn't hostility to, um, to opening the, uh, the research that we do to the broader public. It's that we need to be clear, clear that that needs to work for us, it needs to work for the public, and it needs to be a sustainable solution for the long term rather than something <coughs> which, which works in the, um, in the short term. I think something that wasn't very much picked up in the discussion, but I think we need to forget, is that peer review is an integral part of what we do. Um, and we need, to make, we need to ensure that what we do doesn't undermine the process of peer review. And the implication of that, again, I think this was brought out um, in all the talks, but we didn't talk about it much in the discussion, is that this isn't a free good. Um, and that much of the discussion that we're having is actually not about the principle, it's about how we pay for scholarly communication and how we, how we best manage that balance of interest. Um, and I think underlying all of this is actually there is a divergence. And the divergence is what the outcome should be. And I think for some people, the outcome is a total transformation of the publishing landscape. Um, and for others, the outcome is, um, is the, the simple headline issue about, public, about open access. And I think maybe this afternoon it would be interesting to pick those sorts of underlying theological questions up um, more, in the, more in the discussion. Um, before I ask you to thank our, our speakers, I just want to come back to Terrell. And I want to come back to Terrell because I think there is a real danger in some, some of the, one of the things he said. Which is, I really don't, I really strongly don't believe that British universities are in the business of preventing people from publishing anywhere. But if we say that we're in the business, or that story gets out and about enough, then we can do damage to the sector. And we can do damage particularly to early career um, academics' perceptions of what we're doing. And um, I, I, I think. Uh, I, I really strongly believe that we need to be very responsible about how we message what I think is, a, is an outstanding achievement, that we can get our research um, more um, accessible to um, not just to other academics around the world, but to the public who are, as I said earlier, who are hungry to read us. Um, I promise you lunch is upon us. Um, but before we get there, could I ask you to thank uh, my four panelists. Panel. It is lunchtime, so lunch is going to be served downstairs in the Della Hall where you should have all registered, and we're going to kick off again at 10 past 1 back here.